The Lighthouse Keeper of Aspinwall by Hendrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Curtin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. Chapter 1. On a time it happened that the lighthouse keeper in Aspinwall, not far from Panama, disappeared without a trace. Since he disappeared during a storm, it was supposed that the ill-fated man went to the very edge of the small rocky island on which the lighthouse is situated, and was swept out by a wave. This supposition seemed the more likely, as his boat was not found in its rocky niche the next day. The position of lighthouse keeper had become vacant. It was necessary to fill this position at the earliest, since the lighthouse had no small significance for the local movement, as well as for vessels going from New York to Panama. Mosquito Bay abounds in banks and sandbars. Among these, navigation even in the daytime is difficult, but at night, especially with the fogs, which are so frequent on those waters warmed by the sun of the tropics, it is almost impossible. The only guide at that time for the numerous vessels is the lighthouse. The task of finding a new keeper fell to the United States Consul in Panama, and this task was no small one. First, because it was absolutely necessary to find the man within twelve hours. Second, the man must be unusually conscientious. It was not possible, of course, to take the first comer at random. Finally, there was an utter lack of candidates. Life on a tower is uncommonly difficult, and by no means enticing to people of the South, who love idleness and the freedom of a vagrant life. That lighthouse keeper is almost a prisoner. He cannot leave his rocky island except on Sundays. A boat from Aspinwall brings him provisions and water once a day, and returns immediately. On the whole island, one acre in area, there is no inhabitant. The keeper lives in the lighthouse. He keeps it in order. During the day he gives signals by displaying flags of various colors to indicate changes of the barometer. In the evening he lights the lantern. This would be no great labor, were it not that to reach the lantern at the top of the tower he must pass over more than four hundred steep and very high steps. Sometimes he must make this journey repeatedly during the day. In general it is the life of a monk, and indeed more than that, the life of a hermit. It was not wonderful, therefore, that Mr. Isaac Falconbridge was in no small anxiety as to where he should find a permanent successor to the recent keeper, and it is easy to understand his joy when a successor announced himself most unexpectedly on that very day. He was a man already old, seventy years or more, but fresh, erect, and with the movements and bearing of a soldier. His hair was perfectly white, his face as dark as that of a creole, but judging from his blue eyes he did not belong to a southern people. His face was somewhat downcast and sad, but honest. At the first glance he pleased Falconbridge. It remained only to examine him. Therefore the following conversation began. Where are you from? I'm a Pole. Where have you worked up to this time? In one place and another. A lighthouse keeper should like to stay in one place. I need rest. Have you served? Have you testimonials of honorable government service? The old man drew from his bosom a piece of faded silk resembling a strip of an old flag, unwounded, and said, Here are the testimonials. I received this cross in 1830. This second one is Spanish from the Carlist War. The third is the French Legion. The fourth I received in Hungary. Afterward, I fought in the States against the South. There they do not give crosses. Falconbridge took the paper and began to read. Hmm, Skavinsky, is that your name? Hmm, two flags captured in a bayonet attack. You were a gallant soldier. I am able to be a conscientious lighthouse keeper. It is necessary to ascend the tower a number of times daily. Have you sound legs? I crossed the plains on foot. The immense prairies between the East and California are called the Plains. Do you know sea service? I served three years on a whaler. You have tried various occupations. The only one I have not known is quiet. Why is that? The old man shrugged his shoulders. Such is my fate. Still, you seem to me too old for a lighthouse keeper. Sir, 
exclaimed the candidate suddenly in a voice of emotion i am greatly wearied knocked about i have passed through much as you see this place is one of those which i have wished for most ardently i am old i need rest i need to say to myself here you will remain this is your port ah sir this depends now on you alone another time perhaps such a place will not offer itself what luck that i was in panama i entreat you as god is dear to me i am like a ship which if it misses the harbour will be lost if you wish to make an old man happy i swear to you that i am honest but i have enough of this wandering the blue eyes of the old man expressed such earnest entreaty that falconbridge who had a good simple heart was touched well said he i take you your lighthouse keeper the old man's face gleamed with inexpressible joy i thank you can you go to the tower to-day i can then good-bye another word for any failure in service you will be dismissed all right that same evening when the sun had descended on the other side of the isthmus and a day of sunshine was followed by a night without twilight the new keeper was in his place evidently for the lighthouse was casting its bright rays on the water as usual the night was perfectly calm silent genuinely tropical filled with a transparent haze forming around the moon a great colored rainbow with soft unbroken edges the sea was moving only because the tide raised it skavinsky on the balcony seemed from below like a small black point he tried to collect his thoughts and take in his new position but his mind was too much under pressure to move with regularity he felt somewhat as a hunted beast feels when at last it has found refuge from pursuit on some inaccessible rock or in a cave an hour of quiet had come to him finally the feeling of safety filled his soul with a certain unspeakable bliss now on that rock he can simply laugh at his previous wanderings his misfortunes and failures he was in truth like a ship whose masts ropes and sails had been broken and rent by a tempest and cast from the clouds to the bottom of the sea a ship on which the tempest had hurled waves and spat foam but which had still wound its way to the harbour the pictures of that storm passed through his mind quickly as he compared it with the calm future now beginning a part of his wonderful adventures he had related to falconbridge he had not mentioned however thousands of other incidents it had been his misfortune that as often as he pitched his tent and fixed his fireplace to settle down permanently some wind tore out his tent stakes whirled away the fire and bore him on towards destruction looking now from the balcony of the tower at the illuminated waves he remembered everything through which he had passed he had campaigned in the four parts of the world and in wandering had tried almost every occupation labor loving and honest he had earned money more than once but had always lost it in spite of every provision and the utmost caution he had been a gold miner in australia a diamond digger in africa a rifleman in public service in the east indies he had established a ranch in california the drought ruined him he had tried trading with wild tribes in the interior of brazil his raft was wrecked on the amazon he himself alone weaponless and nearly naked wandered in the forest for many weeks living on wild fruits exposed every moment to death from the jaws of wild beasts he established a forge in helena arcanso and that was burned in a great fire which consumed the whole town next he fell into the hands of indians in the rocky mountains and only through a miracle he was saved by canadian trappers then he served as a sailor on a vessel running between bahia and bordeaux and as a harpooner on a whaling ship both vessels were wrecked he had a cigar factory in havana and was robbed by his partner while he himself was lying sick with the vomito at last he came to aspinwall and there was to be the end of his failures for what could reach him now on that rocky island neither water nor fire nor men but from men skavinsky had not suffered much he had met good men oftener than bad ones but it seemed to him that all the four elements were persecuting him those who knew him said that he had no luck and with that they explained everything he himself became somewhat of a monomaniac he believed that some mighty and vengeful hand was pursuing him everywhere on all lands and waters he did not like however to speak of this only at times when some one asked him whose hand that could be he pointed mysteriously to the polar star and said 
it comes from that place in reality his failures were so continuous that they were wonderful and might easily drive a nail into the head especially of the man who had experienced them but skavinsky had the patience of an indian and that great calm power of resistance which comes from a truth of heart he had received once in hungary a number of bayonet thrusts because he would not grasp at a stirrup which was shown as means of salvation to him and implore quarter in like manner he did not bend to misfortune he crept up against the mountain as industriously as an ant pushed down a hundred times he began his journey calmly for the hundred and first time he was in his way a most peculiar original this old soldier tempered god knows in how many fires hardened in suffering hammered and forged had the heart of a child in time of the epidemic in cuba the vomito attacked him because he had given to the sick all his quinine of which he had a considerable supply and left not a grain to himself there had been in him also this wonderful quality that after so many disappointments he was ever full of confidence and did not lose hope that all would be well yet in winter he grew lively and foretold great events he waited for these events with impatience and lived through whole summers with the thought of them but the winters passed one after another and skavinsky lived only to this that they whitened his head at last he grew old began to lose his energy his endurance was becoming more and more like resignation his former calmness was tending towards supersensitiveness and that tempered soldier was degenerating into a man ready to shed tears for any cause besides this from time to time he was weighted down by a terrible homesickness which was roused by any circumstance the sight of swallows gray birds like sparrows snow on the mountains or melancholy music like that heard on a time finally there was one idea which mastered him the idea of rest it mastered the old man thoroughly and swallowed all other hopes and desires this ceaseless wanderer could not imagine anything more to be longed for anything more precious than a quiet corner in which to rest and wait for the end in silence perhaps specially because some whim of fate had so harried him over all seas and lands that he could hardly catch breath did he imagine that the highest human happiness was simply not to wander it is true that such modest happiness was due to him but he was so accustomed to disappointments that he thought of rest as people in general think of a thing which surpasses attainment he dared not hope for it meanwhile unexpectedly in the course of twelve hours he had gained a position which was as if chosen for him out of all in the world we are not to wonder then that when he lighted his lantern in the evening he was as if dazed that he asked himself if that was reality and dared not answer that it was but at the same time reality convinced him with inconvertible proofs hence hours one after another passed while he was on the balcony he gazed and convinced himself it might seem that he was looking at a sea for the first time in his life the lens of the lantern cast into the darkness an enormous triangle of light beyond which the eye of the old man was lost in the black distance completely in a distance mysterious and awful but that distance seemed to run towards the light the long waves following one another rolled out of the darkness and went bellowing toward the base of the island and then their foaming backs were visible shining rose-colored in the light of the lantern the incoming tide swelled more and more and covered the sandy bars the mysterious speech of the ocean came with a fullness more powerful and louder at one time like the thunder of cannon at another like the roar of great forests at another like the distant dull sound of the voices of people at moments it was quiet then to the ears of the old man came with great sigh then a kind of sobbing and again threatening outbursts at last the wind bore away the haze and brought black broken clouds which hid the moon from the west it began to blow more and more the waves sprang with rage against the rock of the lighthouse licking with foam the foundation walls in the distance a storm was beginning to bellow on the dark disturbed expanse certain green lanterns gleamed from the masts of ships these green points rose high and then sank now they swayed to the right and now to the left skavinsky descended to his room the storm began to howl 
Outside people on those ships were struggling with night, with darkness, with waves, but inside the tower it was still and calm. Even the sounds of the storm hardly came through the thick walls, and only the measured tick-tack of the clock lulled the wearied old man to his slumber. Chapter 2 Hours, days, and weeks passed. Sailors assert that at times, when the sea is greatly roused, something from out the midst of night and darkness calls them by name. If the infinity of the sea may call out thus, perhaps when a man is growing old, calls come to him too from another infinity still darker and more deeply mysterious. And the more he is wearied by life, the dearer become those calls to him. But to hear them, quiet is needed. Besides, old age loves to seclude itself, as if with a foreknowledge of the grave. The lighthouse had become for Skavinsky such a half-grave. Nothing is more monotonous than life on a beacon tower. If young people consent to take up this service, they leave it soon after. Lighthouse keepers are generally men not young, gloomy, and confined to themselves. If by chance one of them leaves his lighthouse and goes among men, he walks in the midst of them like a person roused from deep slumber. On the tower there is a lack of minute impressions which in ordinary life teach men to adapt themselves to everything. All that a lighthouse keeper comes in contact with is gigantic and devoid of forms sharply outlined. The sky is one whole, the water another, and between those two infinites the soul of man is in loneliness. That is a life in which thought is continual meditation, and out of that meditation nothing rouses the keeper, not even his work. Day is like day, as two beats in a rosary, unless changes of weather form the only variety. But Skavinsky felt more happiness than ever in his life before. He rose with the dawn, took his breakfast, polished the lens, and then, sitting on the balcony, gazed into the distance of the water, and his eyes were never sated with the pictures which he saw before him. On the enormous turquoise ground of the ocean were to be seen generally flocks of swollen sails gleaming in the rays of the sun, with such brightness that the eyes blinked before the excess of light. Sometimes ships, favoured by the so-called trade winds, went in an extended line one after another, like a chain of sea mews or albatrosses. The red casks indicating the channel swayed on the light wave with gentle movement. Among the sails appeared every afternoon gigantic greyish feather-light plumes of smoke. That was a steamer from New York which brought passengers and goods to Aspinwall, drawing behind it a frothy puff of foam. On the other side of the balcony, Skavinsky saw as if on his palm Aspinwall and its bushy harbour, and in it a forest of masts, boats, and craft. A little farther, white houses and the steeples of the town. From the height of his tower, the small houses were like the masts of sea mews, the boats were like beetles, and the people moved around like small points on the white stone boulevard. From early morning a light eastern breeze brought a confused hum of human life, above which predominated the whistle of steamers. In the afternoon six o'clock came. The movement in the harbour began to cease. The mews hid themselves in the rents of the cliffs. The waves grew feeble and became in some sort lazy. And then, on the land, on the sea, and on the tower, came a time of stillness unbroken by anything. The yellow sands from which the waves had fallen back glittered like golden spots on the expanse of waters. The body of the tower was outlined definitely in blue. Floods of sunbeams were poured from the sky on the water and the sands and the cliff. At that time a certain lassitude full of sweetness seized the old man. He felt that the rest which he was enjoying was excellent, and when he thought that it would be continuous, nothing was lacking him. Skavinsky was intoxicated with his own happiness, and since a man adapts himself easily to improved conditions, he gained faith and confidence gradually. For he thought that if men built houses for invalids, why should not God gather up at last his own invalid? Time passed and confirmed him in this conviction. The old man grew accustomed to his tower, to the lantern, to the rock, to the sandbars, to solitude. He grew accustomed also to the sea mews, which hatched in the crevices of the rock, and in the evening held meetings on the roof of the lighthouse. 
Skavinsky threw to them generally the remnants of his food, and soon they grew tame, and afterward, when he fed them, a real storm of white wings encircled him, and the old man went among the birds like a shepherd among sheep. When the tide ebbed, he went to the low sandbanks, on which he collected savory periwinkles and beautiful pearl shells of the Nautilus, which receding waves had left on the sand. In the night, by the moonlight and the tower, he went to catch fish, which frequented the windings of the cliffs in myriads. At last he was in love with his rocks and his treeless little island, grown over only with small thick plants, exuding sticky resin. The distant views repaid him for the poverty of the island, however. During afternoon hours, when the air became very clear, he could see the whole isthmus covered with the richest vegetation. It seemed to Skavinsky at such times that he saw one gigantic garden, bunches of cocoa and enormous musa, combined as it were in luxurious tufted bouquets, right there behind the houses of Aspinwall. Further on, between Aspinwall and Panama, over which every morning and evening hung a reddish haze of exhalation, a real tropical forest with its feet in stagnant water, interlaced with lianas and filled with the sound of one sea of gigantic orchards, palm milk trees, iron trees, gum trees. Through his field grass the old man could see not only trees and the broad leaves of bananas, but even legions of monkeys and great marabouts and flock of parrots rising at times like a rainbow cloud over the forest. Skavinsky knew such forests well, for after being wrecked on the Amazon he had wandered whole weeks among similar arches and thickets. He had seen how many dangers and deaths lie concealed under those marvelous and smiling exteriors. During the nights which he had spent in them he heard close at hand the sepulchral voices of howling monkeys and the roaring of the jaguars. He saw gigantic serpents coiled like lianas on trees. He knew those slumbering forest lakes, full of torpedo fish and swarming with crocodiles. He knew under what a yoke man lives in those unexplored wildernesses in which are single leaves tenfold greater in size than a man wildernesses swarming with blood-drinking mosquitoes, tree leeches, and immense poisonous spiders. He had experienced that forest life himself, had witnessed it, had passed through it, therefore it gave him the greatest enjoyment to look from his height and gaze on those matos, admire their beauty, and be guarded from their treachery. His tower preserved him from every evil. He left it only for a few hours on Sunday. He put on then his blue keeper's coat with silver buttons, and hung his crosses on his breast. His milk-white head was raised with a certain pride when he heard at the door, while entering the church, the creoles saying among themselves, We have an honorable lighthouse keeper and not a heretic, though he is a Yankee. But he returned straight away after mass to his island, and returned happy, for still he distrusted the mainland. On Sunday also he read the Spanish newspaper, which he bought in the town, or the New York Herald, which he borrowed from Falconbridge, and he sought in it European news eagerly. The poor old heart on this lighthouse tower and in another hemisphere was beating yet for its birthplace. At times, too, when the boat brought his daily supplies and water to the island, he went down from the tower to talk with Johnson, the guard, but after a while he seemed to grow shy. He ceased to go to the town to read the papers and to go down to talk politics with Johnson. Whole weeks passed in this way, so that no one saw him and he saw no one. The only signs that the old man was living were the disappearance of the provisions left on the shore and the light of the lantern kindled every evening with the same regularity with which the sun rose in the morning from the waters of those regions. Evidently the old man had become indifferent to the world. Homesickness was not the cause, but just this, that even homesickness had passed into resignation. The whole world began now and ended for Skavinsky on his island. He had grown accustomed to the thought that he would not leave the tower till death, and he simply forgot that there was anything else in the world aside from him. Moreover, he had become a mystic. His mild blue eyes began to stare like the eyes of a child, and were as if fixed on something at a distance. In presence of a surrounding uncommonly simple and great, the old man was losing the feeling of personality. He was ceasing to exist as an individual, 
was becoming merged more and more into that which enclosed him. He did not understand anything beyond his environment. He felt only unconsciously. At last it seems to him that the heavens, the water, his rocks, the tower, the golden side-banks, and the swollen sails, the sea-mews, the ebb and flow of the tide, all form one mighty unity, one enormous mysterious sail, that he is sinking in that mystery, and feels that soul which lives and lulls itself. He sinks and is rocked, forgets himself, and in that narrowing of his individual existence, in that half-waking, half-sleeping, he has discovered a rest so great that it almost resembled half-death. Chapter 3 But the Awakening Came On a certain day, when the boat brought water and a supply of provisions, Skavinsky came down an hour later from the tower, and saw that besides the usual cargo there was an additional package. On the outside of this package was postage stamps of the United States, and the address, Skavinsky Esquire, written on coarse canvas. The old man, with aroused curiosity, cut the canvas, and saw books. He took one in his hand, looked at it, and put it back. Thereupon his hands began to tremble greatly. He covered his eyes as if he did not believe them. It seemed to him as if he were dreaming. The book was Polish. What did that mean? Who could have sent the book? Clearly he did not remember at the first moment that in the beginning of his lighthouse career he had read in the Herald borrowed from the consul of the formation of a Polish society in New York and had sent at once to that society half his month's salary, for which he had, moreover, no use on the tower. The society had sent him the books with thanks. The books came in the natural way, but at the first moment the old man could not seize these thoughts. Polish books in Aspinwall, on his tower, amid his solitude, that was for him something uncommon, a certain breath from past times, a species of miracle. Now it seemed to him, as to those sailors in the night, that something was calling him by name, with a voice greatly beloved and nearly forgotten. He sat for a while with closed eyes, and was almost certain that, when he opened them, the dream would be gone. The package, cut open, lay before him shone upon clearly by the afternoon sun, and on it was an open book. When the old man stretched his hand toward it again, he heard in the stillness the beating of his own heart. He looked. It was poetry. On the outside stood printed in great letters the title, underneath the name of the author. The name was not strange to Skavinsky. He saw that it belonged to the famous poet, whose productions he had read in 1830 in Paris. Afterward, when campaigning in Algiers and Spain, he had heard from his countrymen of the growing fame of the great seer, but he was so accustomed to the musket at that time that he took no book in hand. In 1849 he went to America, and in the adventurous life which he led he hardly ever met a Pole, and never a Polish book. With the greater eagerness, therefore, and with a livelier beating of the heart, did he turn to the title page. It seemed to him then that on his lonely rock some solemnity was about to take place. Indeed, it was a moment of great calm and silence. The clocks of Aspinwall were striking, five in the afternoon. Not a cloud darkened the clear sky, only a few sea mews were sailing through the air. The ocean was as if cradled to sleep. The waves on the shore stammered quietly, spreading softly on the sand. In the distance, the white house of Aspinwall and the wonderful groups of palms were smiling. In truth, there was something there solemn, calm, and full of dignity. Suddenly, in the midst of that calm of nature, was heard the trembling voice of the old man, who read aloud as if to understand himself better. Thou art like health, O Litva, my birthland. How much we should prize thee, he only can know who has lost thee. Thy beauty in perfect adornment this day I see and describe, because I yearn for thee. His voice failed Skavinsky. The letters began to dance before his eyes. Something broke in his breast and went like a wave from his heart higher and higher, choking his voice and pressing his throat. A moment more he controlled himself and read further. O holy lady who guardest bright Częstochowa, who shinest in the Ostra Brama and preservest the castle town Novogrudek with its trusty people, as thou didst give me back to health in childhood, when by my weeping mother placed beneath thy care, 
I raised my lifeless eyelids upward, and straightway walk unto thy holy threshold to thank God for the life restored me. So by a wonder now restore us to the bosom of our birthplace. The swollen wave broke through the restraint of his will. The old man sobbed and threw himself on the ground. His milk-white hair was mingled with the sand of the sea. Forty years had passed since he had seen his country, and God knows how many since he heard his native speech. And now that speech had come to him itself. It had sailed to him over the ocean and found him in solitude on another hemisphere. It so loved, so dear, so beautiful. In the sobbing which shook him there was no pain, only a suddenly aroused immense love, in the presence of which other things are as nothing. With that great weeping he had simply implored forgiveness of his beloved one, set aside because he had grown so old, had become so accustomed to his solitary rock, and had so forgotten it that in him every longing had begun to disappear. But now it returned as if by a miracle. Therefore the heart leaped in him. Moments vanished one after another. He lay there continually. The muse flew over the lighthouse, crying as if alarmed for their old friend. The hour in which he fed them with the remnants of his food had come. Therefore some of them flew down from the lighthouse to him. Then more and more came, and began to pick and to shake their wings over his head. The sound of the wings roused him. He had wept his fill, and had now a certain calm and brightness, but his eyes were as if inspired. He gave unwittingly all his provisions to the birds, which rushed at him with an uproar, and he himself took the book again. The sun had gone already behind the gardens and the forest of Panama, and was going slowly beyond the isthmus to the other ocean. But the Atlantic was full of light yet. In the open air there was still perfect vision. Therefore he read further. Now bear my longing soul to those forest slopes, to those green meadows. At last the dusk obliterated the letters on the white paper. The dusk short as a twinkle. The old man rested his head on the rock and closed his eyes. Then she who defends bright Częstochowa took his soul and transported it to those fields colored by various grain. In the sky were burning yet those long stripes, red and golden, and on those brightnesses he was flying to beloved regions. The pine woods were sounding in his ears. The streams of his native place were murmuring. He saw everything as it was. Everything asked him, Dost remember? He remembers. He sees broad fields, between the fields, woods, and villages. It is night now. At this hour his lantern usually illuminates the darkness of the sea, but now he is in his native village. His old head has dropped on his breast, and he is dreaming. Pictures are passing before his eyes quickly and a little disorderly. He does not see the house in which he was born, for war had destroyed it. He does not see his father and mother, for they died when he was a child. But still the village is as if he had left it yesterday. The line of cottages with light in the windows, the mound, the mill, the two ponds opposite each other, and thundering the whole night with a chorus of frogs. Once he had been on guard in that village all night. Now that past stood before him at once in a series of views. He was an Uwan again, and he stands there on guard. At a distance is the public house. He looks with swimming eyes. There is thundering and singing and shouting amid the silence of the night, with voices of fiddles and bass viols. Uha, uha! Then the Uwans knock out fire with their horseshoes, and it is wearisome for him there on his horse. The hours drag on slowly. At last the lights are quenched. Now, as far as the eye reaches, there is mist, and mist impenetrable. Now the fog rises, evidently from the fields, and embraces the whole world with a whitish cloud. You would say a perfect ocean, but that is fields. Soon the land rail will be heard in the darkness, and bitterns will call from the reeds. The night is calm and cool, a true Polish night. In the distance the pine wood is sounding without wind, like the roll of the sea. Soon dawn will whiten the east. In fact, the cocks are beginning to crow behind the hedges. One answers another from cottage to cottage. The storks are screaming somewhere on high. The Uwan feels well and bright. Someone had spoken of a battle tomorrow. Hey, that will go on like all others, with shouting, with fluttering of pennants. The young blood is playing like a trumpet, though the night cools it. But day is dawning. Already night is growing pale. Out of the shadows come forests, the thicket, a row of cottages, the mill, the poplars. 
the well is squeaking like a metal banner on a tower what a beloved land beautiful in the rosy gleams of the morning oh the one land the one land quiet the watchful picket hears that someone is approaching of course they are coming to relieve the guard suddenly some voice is heard above skavinsky here old man get up what's the matter the old man opens his eyes and looks with wonder at the person standing before him the remnants of the dream visions struggle in his head with reality at last the visions pale and vanish before him stands johnson the harbour guard what's this asked johnson are you sick no you didn't light the lantern you must leave your place the vessel from st jerome was wrecked on the bar it is lucky that no one was drowned or you would go to trial get into the boat with me you'll hear the rest at the consulate the old man grew pale in fact he had not lighted the lantern that night a few days later skavinsky was seen on the deck of a steamer which was going from aspinwall to new york the poor man had lost his place there opened before him new roads of wandering the wind had torn that leaf away again to whirl it over lands and seas to sport with it till satisfied the old man had failed greatly during those few days and his body was bent but his eyes were gleaming on his new road of life he held at his breast a book which from time to time he pressed with his hand as if fearing that it too might go from him end of the lighthouse keeper of aspinwall by henrik sienkiewicz